and to hold the camp with a very short series. To understand the present conundrum in Palestine, one has to step back into history. The Roman general, Marcus of the Aurelius, once said, look back over the past, with its changing empires that rose and fell, and then you'll be able to foresee the future. So let's go back into the evening of the empires of our time. The aftermath of the First World War, as mentioned by one of the students in the Western Europe, saw the disintegration of the imperial dynasties, the German Palmzalans, the Austrian Habsburgs, and the Russian Romanovs. In the East, the once that one. In the East, the once mighty Ottoman Empire collapsed. It is noted as much from external pressures as from the living due to its own excesses. At its peak, the Ottoman Empire included, as you see, Turkey and as far west as Hungary. Close to home, it controlled Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and parts of the European Peninsula and North Africa. It covers an area of 19, almost 20 million square kilometers. It was second only to the British Empire. Slide number two, please. No, slide number two. The British Empire. I think it's split the slide. But anyway, it was second only to the British Empire. But you notice, though, that the Ottoman, unlike the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire was not geographically contiguous. Great Britain won the First and the Second World Wars, but at a price. The price they paid was the gradual loss of its empire. The price the US exacted from the Ottoman Empire was the creation of Jordan, Palestine, and then Newland, Israel. World War I was deemed to be the war to end the all wars. To ensure peace, the victors in World War I created the League of Nations in 1920, and its aim was disarmament, preventing wars from collective security, settling disputes to country, uh, to, between countries uh, through negotiation and diplomacy, and improving global warfare, welfare. For this lofty aim, its architect, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, as Niasa has mentioned, received the Nobel Peace Prize. Incidentally, the Nobel Peace Prize has been awarded later in 1978 to Angoro Sabah and Reagan, and in 1994, jointly to Yasser Arafat, Shimon Peres, and Yitzhak Rabin. Yet, a durable peace eludes Palestine, Israel, and the United Nations. By 1939, it was clear that the League of Nations had failed as a peacekeeping body. It was replaced post World War II by the United Nations. But the UN based international order is gradually losing ground as Noam Chomsky and Chomsky had pointed out, to a US-based order. The difference between the two is that the US-based world order is predicated on the principle that if you follow the United States, you're following the rules. Even the UN-based international order is grounded on the United Nations Charter. It is this adherence to international norms of conduct that made China support us in 1971. It was not because China condoned what we were doing in East Pakistan, it was because they upheld the principles of territorial integrity and non interference in other states. They regarded the East Pakistan crisis as Pakistan's internal matter. History is one aspect of the present Palestinian Israeli conflict, the other is geography. Slide changes. Look at the map of modern Palestine. In this, you'll see that the Gaza Strip is north and is controlled by Hamas, and the southern part of Gaza by Fatah. Now, the comparisons that have been drawn with the East Pakistan, West Pakistan, etc., they bear no relationship to this. Here, it is an occupying, uh, occupying force which has gradually encroached into other areas. Father Rizafullah, once our foreign minister, told me that Pakistan was the prototype for Israel. Western nations calculated in 1945 that if the creation of Pakistan could be justified on the basis of religion, there may be little argument against creation of another democratic state, Israel. Incidentally, since you're all students of international relations, can you name one other theocratic state in the world? 
where the head of state and the head of administration of the uh, politics is the same. Any one of you? One of the Vatican, absolutely. But Vatican has no authority. But you're absolutely right. Another one? Yes. But I don't want to waste my time on this. The United Kingdom. Britain. The head of the Church of England is also the constitutional head of the country. So it, we are not an anomaly. There are precedents for this. Why is the state of Palestine still not the Palestine state? In 1918, Great Britain, as was mentioned earlier, was granted a mandate for Palestine by the League of Nations for the administration of the territory of Palestine and from the Jordan, which later became Jordan and Iraq. Now, for students of international relations, the difference between a mandate and a protectorate is that a mandate is responsible to a third party as such. A protectorate is not responsible. So, Great Britain, who has had the crucial state with Israel and was a protectorate for them, but it had a mandate for Palestine. Seventy years later, the Palestinian Declaration of Independence formally established the de, 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 de jure sovereign state. That declaration was acknowledged by 78 countries. A hundred years later, 138 of the 193 United Nations and the states recognized it. Israel, by comparison, was recognized by 165. Today, the conflict is between the United Nations acknowledged, fully if not recognized, state of Israel and the United Nations semi acknowledged state of Palestine. Can the present retaliation by Israel, it's one of the questions you asked last time, be deemed to be a violation of international law? I doubt it. Violation of human rights is certainly, but not international law. The 9 11 attack was a violation of international law. But by whom? 15 of the terrorists were citizens of Saudi Arabia, two were from the United Arab Emirates, one from Egypt, and one from Lebanon. And yet the U.S. retaliated, not by striking back at one of these countries, but by invading Afghanistan. And that too, with the United Nations approval. That invasion, if any in history, constitution a violation of international law. Is the media coverage of the present conflict in Pakistan biased? The second question you asked of us, of course it is. We in Pakistan discovered how biased the BBC was during the coverage in 1971. We've seen it repeatedly since then in the media's coverage of the conflicts in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Afghanistan, and now Ukraine. One should not be surprised. He who pays the piper calls the tune. Al Jazeera's nominal impartiality notwithstanding, the rich Arab countries are not prepared to outbid. Western media. And in this context, I recall the comment by Dr. Martin Luther King, another Nobel Prize winner, who said, In the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but we will remember the silence of our friends. And now to the most important question today Can peace be actualized? I am not taking the advantage, taking advantage of the presence of Nyaya. In his book, From Neither Adult Nor a Book, he discloses that in 2005 he was whisked off to a secret rendezvous in Istanbul with Israeli Foreign Minister Simon Shalom. They enjoyed a moonlit dinner on the rooftop of the Top Kapi Palace. Am I right, Nyansa? In the formal talks the next day, I thought I'd preempt you. In that formal talk the next day, Putin Kasuri Saab raised the issue of Indo Israeli cooperation, the Palestine issue, and Kashmir. Right? The Israeli foreign minister preferred to talk about interstate cooperation on agriculture and sophisticated technology. Henry Kissinger would have described that as a dialogue with the dead. Like the Tariq Aziz, Satish Lambad secret talks on Jammu and Kashmir, the Kasuli Shalom talks were enjoyable. 
but did not end with a result. They were pleasurable, muta, but they didn't lead to a nikah. Will there be peace in Palestine? <laughs> well, that's the title of your next book. Will there ever be peace in Palestine? Well, the answer is no. Not in my lifetime, and not in the lifetime of any one of you students here. And certainly not after President Joe Biden's irrefined, recent, inflammatory trip to Tel Aviv. He has done nothing more than put sandalwood, more sandalwood, on the funeral fire. There'll be no peace, even after peace is declared. That's not because I say, say so, but because the famous Jew, Henry Kissinger, who stopped bombing North Vietnam and as a result in 1973 was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for doing so, predicted a nation of three million in whatever borders can be conceived, surrounded by a hundred million people that will never fully be reconciled to its existence, even if it has been accepted has reason to be uneasy. After all, India has recognized Pakistan as a state, and yet no one would describe the relations between them as being one of great confidence. Pakistan's sense of being threatened, rightly or wrongly, has never abated. It has remained the root of Pakistani politics and diplomacy, even after peace was negotiated. Albert Einstein, another Jew, once said, peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. And it is this very lack of understanding that has created schisms between us, Muslims, Christians, and Jews, even though we are descendants of the same holy prophet Abraham. I think he deserved better sons than us. Thank you very much indeed.